Look, there's the other scenario, and I would just call that one the Cheetos and meth scenario. Right? And PlayStation. <laughs> and PlayStation, right? And like, and I like Netflix. I'm a fan of Netflix, but like, maybe not 12 hours a day. That's the existence of a cow. <laughs> cows are great, yeah. um, but like, I don't think we should be cows. Hello, and welcome to the Mark and Ben podcast. Today, we're going to talk about a post that Mark recently wrote. Uh, called the Techno Optimist Manifesto. Um, and like all good manifestos, many people loved it. Many people hated it. Uh, and so there, that's given us a lot to talk about. Um, I just want to actually point out my favorite uh, of the uh, people that hated it was an article that was published in TechCrunch called uh, When's the Last Time Mark Andreessen Has Spoken to Poor People or a Poor Person or something like that. Uh, and the thing that's so funny about it is that Mark, of all the people I know, I probably don't know anybody who's more self-made than Mark because he grew up in a tiny town in Wisconsin. He went to public schools, like not good public schools, like probably some of the uh, worst public schools in the country and um, and like never got any money you know, from home, not because his parents didn't love him. They didn't have any money to give him. Uh, so, and then the people who wrote the article all went to like the fanciest schools I've ever heard of. Um, and you know, Ivy leagues and wonderful private high schools and these kinds of things. So now we have people who grew up rich telling somebody who grew up poor and massively succeeded what's good for poor people who want to succeed. So that's, I just thought that was so funny. Anyway, <laughs> so this one's gotten a lot of uh, kick to it, so we're going to get right into it. Um, the first question. Can I, hey Ben, can I? Oh, go ahead. Can, can I weigh in on that? Yes, sir. Can I weigh in on that? You you can't start that way, and then don't let me talk. You're not let me say something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so it's too tempting. Um, it, it, look, it's it's a uh, the you know it's the, 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 the sort of that response is it's a classic example of what Rob Hed what Rob Henderson, the author Rob H Henderson, calls luxury beliefs, uh -huh. uh, right? And so. Right. And so a luxury belief, right? The definition of luxury belief is it's a belief that could be held by somebody who's in sort of a, you know, sort of an elite position, uh, you know, position of power, position of, of, uh, of wealth and comfort, um, you know, about how society should be ordered that is incorrect. Um, and the consequences of which would be disastrous, right, for the people uh, that would be subjected to the consequences of that belief. Um, but, uh, you know, the people who hold the belief are insulated from the consequences, right? They live in, you know, kind of fancy places and, and, and have uh, very good lifestyles and, and, and aren't going aren't, aren't to suffer directly as a result. So, so anyway, it's, it's a classic, it's a great example of a luxury belief. Um, you know, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of factual response to it, of course, is that capitalism and free markets um, are, are the machine that has lifted people out of poverty for, you know, 500 years. Yeah, um, we've run the, the experiment. That, the other systems don't seem to work as well. Many, many, many times, you know, and we, it's, this is one of those things, and you know, some amazing things we ran, exactly to your point, we ran this experiment, you know, hundreds of times in the, in the, in the 20th century, and, and the results are very clear. Uh, and, you know, look, most recently in China, you know, there's a direct correlation between the degree to which the Chinese Communist Party kind of takes its boot off the throat of the people in terms of their ability to engage in markets and engage in trade and, and the extent to which the, their quality of life rises. And so, you, you know, you kind of still see that, you know, playing out today. And how quickly it reverses um, when, they, when they move to central planning. Of a hundred percent, and so, and you just see this over and over again, and and you know, then and then you know, you see it happening in other other parts of the world also, and so, you know, it's this thing where you know, it's just like more, more more times running the same experiment are not going to generate different results, um, and and then the result of this, of course, is that this is kind of so obvious and well established at this point that you have to go to, you know, one of our finest elite, you know, private high schools and private, you know, universities <laughs> to really get inculcated, um, <laughs> right, to in, 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 into the luxury belief system. That's going to be all exactly. trying to help. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, now that's a excellent, excellent start. Um, so, this first question is from St. Louis of Techni. What does effective pessimism look like? I, how can people who want to mitigate risks make sure not to waste their time on moral pa panic that stymies progress? You know, look, this is really tough, right? And let, let, you know, let's start by you know conceding the you know kind of giving the devil his due, kind of conceding the you know the the, the strength of the other side's argument on this. Um, you know, which is like, look, as I say in the essay, like I, you know, I'm not a utopian. Um, you know, technology is not purely a force for good. Um, you know, technolo te technologies are tools, and they can be used for both good and bad. And you know, virtually every technology that man has ever invented 
um, has been used for both good and bad. And so it, it's it's not that there aren't downsides, and it's not fire. that there aren't risks. <laughs> and the red What's bird. <laughs> Yeah, starting with fire. I mean, look, like you know, this is a reference in in the, in the piece. Uh, uh, this uh, you know, the myth of Prometheus, which is kind of the origin myth in in, in Western society of of sort of the implications of technology. And you know, in the Prometheus myth, you know, Prometheus is the is the god that brought um, brought fire to man. And you know, for that, he was punished by being you know uh, by, by by Zeus by being uh, chained to a rock and having his liver pecked out every night uh, by a bird. Uh, and then it would regenerate in the morning, and then it would happen again the next day. So you know, very exquisite form of torture that Zeus came up with. And, 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 you know, the reason that myth is so powerful is because look, fire, fire was the enabler of, you know, heat, uh, and light and cooking food, right. And defense and shelter, you know, for, for early man, but it was also a weapon, you know, from the very beginning, it was a weapon of war. Right. And if, if, for example, you're engaged in, you know, you know, siege combat, and, you know, you're, you're going up against a fortified, you know, castle or city, the way that you win is you burn them out. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, the way they retaliate is they pour boil, you know, boiling, they heat up oil to, to uh, boiling uh, temperatures and they pour it on your head. Right. So, so yeah, so, 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 so both sides of these are, are, are true. And this, you know, this, this continues to be the case, you know, to this day. Um, and, and then basically these are kind of the two, you know, actually the effective pessimism is a clever framing. Um, you know, these are kind of the two kind of, I don't know, valences that you can apply to, to this question, which is you could apply, you know, one valence is basically fundamentally over time, net, you know, everything. Technology has been primarily a force for good, primarily a force for progress. Um, and basically you embrace it and 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 support it and accelerate it as much as you can. And then and then you deal with the issues as as they arise, you know, which which is the story of the development of, of, of modern civilization. Um, you know, there there is another valence, and 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 you know, people uh, you know, so, some people incline more more naturally to, to to the pessimistic position, which is basically and this is true by the way, of both technologies and markets, people also apply the same kind of negative valence to markets, which is well, primarily, you know, technology or markets are a generator of bad things, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh technology technology is a weapon of war, you know, technology is something that has negative, you know, unanticipated negative consequences, markets as, as uh, you know, ha, you know, markets, markets have winners and losers, right? And so, you know, do you focus, you know, do you, do you start out focusing more on the winners or, or on the losers? Um, and so you just kind of have to decide, you know, where, where you go in. What, what I find, you know, the accusation, of course, from the pessimists is, is, is the optimists are too optimistic. You know, the, the, the counter accusation, of course, is if you start out with a pessimistic frame, it's very hard to hold that in a moderate position is what I, is what I observe. Um, the, the pessimists sort of slide into greater and greater levels of pessimism quite quickly. Um, and you know, they end up very angry and bitter and hostile. Um, and they end up advocating for extremely, you know, I would say draconian and kind of senseless policies. Um, and so I, I think it's hard to be an effective pessimist. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it seems to be much easier to become a, a, I would say, you know, either an ineffective pessimist or just a flat out dangerous pessimist. Yeah. You, you know, Andy Grove had a great, line on this, somebody asked him, uh, was the microprocessor good or bad? And he said, well, that's a crazy question. It's like asking is steel good or bad? It is like, you're not going to hold back progress. And so the, what you have to ask yourself is, you know, how do you, how do you make it good? But, but don't try and do that by banning it. Cause you well, the, you know, see that, that you're going to get frustrated. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd argue with Andy on that is, you know, they, they do get banned, right? Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, steel didn't get banned, but, uh, you know, nuclear, civilian nuclear power did. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the pessimists, I mean, look, like I, I mentioned in the piece, you know, I think the single biggest policy mistake of my lifetime was the decision in the 70s, effectively in the 70s into the 80s, to ban, essentially ban civilian nuclear power. And, yeah. and you know, for sure throughout most of the U.S. and then, you know, throughout certainly most of Europe as well. Uh, with you know maybe France being the big exception, um, and then and then by extension throughout you know a lot of the rest of the world because it would have been Western you know countries and, and and companies that would have brought it to to the rest of the world in that in that time period, yeah. um, and you know look I think the consequences for that like I think I think if you're an env environmentalist and you you kind of are looking at things dispassionately as Stuart Brand and others you know have been doing now you know for a while it, you, you kind of say you know look we had the silver bullet for a sort of unlimited zero emission energy. Um, and we had it and we chose not to use it. Um, and you know, with everything we know today, it's overwhelmingly both, you know, the, the safe, effective and, you know, kind of zero, you know, kind of risk, you know, zero risk of, of, you know, of mass death, zero risk of contributing to, uh, you know, carbon emissions and so forth. Um, but you know, look, we made it, we made, we collectively made a political decision to ban it and we're, you know, paying the price for that today. And, you know, quite frankly, it's one of the reasons why Russia is able to do what it's doing in Ukraine is it has this flow of money from, from oil. 
um, you know, which in, in a counterfactual universe where the world by now had cut over to civilian electric power, like they, they wouldn't have that. They wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. So the, the consequences of that decision play out decades later. Um, and and I, I think that's a great illustration of the risk of, let's say not the risk of effective pessimism, let's say the risk of, of, uh, of, of dangerous pessimism. Yeah. And dr- dramatic example of narrative defeating data, because it's very, very obvious from the data that nuclear is far safer than, say, oil or coal. All right, second question. And this is from your friend and mine, Shaka Senghor. Um, How can we distribute transformative philosophies like yours to marginalized communities where a culture of despair and victimization predominates? predominates? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question for me because I think that it, it does get to the heart of like one of the reasons why uh, victimization predominates is because um, it's the kind of, it's a techno pessimistic world, um, right. you know, in, in those communities, in the marginalized communities. And I, I, I would say I go back to, um, you know, there have been uh, some very kind of interesting and successful leaders. Uh, Marcus Garvey comes to mind who, and I think it starts with, you know, something that he really, really was um, heavily behind, which is this idea of self-determination, that mm-hmm. in, an individual can change their, change their own lives, change their own circumstances. And then, you know, he had this idea uh, at the turn of the, pre, of the turn of the 18th to 1900s, um, and, you know, which was a kind of much more <laughs> difficult time to do that, particularly for kind of black people in America. Um, but, you know, he himself succeeded at it greatly. And I think it really starts with that mindset where you, ha- if you don't believe um, that you can be successful in life or with the new technology or with kind of moving the world forward, then you can't. And Henry Ford's famous line, you know, there are two men, uh, one believes he can do it, the other believes he can't can't do it, and they're both right, I think is the key to that whole thing is it just starts with the belief that you can succeed. Um, And look, the odds are harder for some than others, but, um, you know, you always end in despair if you believe you can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, and I just add, you know, building a little bit on the on the uh, uh, on the the sort of uh, uh, (laughs) the tech crunch argument. Yeah. you know, look on the consumption side. So one of the, this is sort of one of the amazing things about free markets, like free markets are the most beneficial to the lowest income and the most advantaged. And that is, you know, a, you know, that's a, you know, counterintuitive mind bender for a lot of people who have been trained at <laughs> elite institutions to hate, to hate capitalism, but <laughs> trained in the opposite the direction, but truth. But it's the, the the truth is it's it's the best for the poorest. It's the best for the people who have the least. Um, and, and by the least, I mean you know the least existing wealth, but also the least access. You know the least social status, um, right? Um, who are kind of on the receiving end of, of not a lot of not a lot of advantage in their lives. And 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 you can kind of look at that on, on two sides of their lives. You can look at that for them as producers and as consumers. Um, so on the production side, you know markets open up opportunity, right? Uh, for uh, you know for people to be able to make their way in the world and for you know to be able to have jobs, be able to make money, and then ultimately be able to support a family. Um, and so, you know, again, the counterfactual here, you know, the counterfactual is not, you know, a poor person, right. Trying to navigate their way through, you know, the hell of a capitalist economy versus somehow in a, in a socialist or communist system, they'd be handed, you know, kind of handed everything they need. Right. The reality is it's, you know, it's the other way around. It's, it's, it's sort of the, the, the more capitalism, the more, the more opportunities are, the more available jobs, but the more, right. The more lines of, yeah. right. The more lines of work, the more, you know, the, the, the more openness and freedom and choice, uh, to be able to figure out how to, uh, you know, how to succeed. Um, and how to make money and, and what work to do. Um, you know, you end up on the wrong side of a, you know, authoritarian, re- you know, communist regime or a socialist regime or an authoritarian regime, right? Um, uh, y- you are, you know, you are screwed. Like, y- y- there are no jobs for you, right? Nobody's hiring. There are no private employers. Um, you know, if the state, you know, for whatever reason doesn't want to hire you, like, you're out of luck. If you're in a, you know, disadvantaged class category, if you're in a, you know, disadvantaged, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, <laughs> sexual orientation, any of these yeah. things, or just, you know, political views or whatever, or just that you're poor, um, and people look down on you, like, you, 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 that's it. Like, you're done. Like, at that point, you're a ward of the state and, you know, whatever amount of, you know, small amount of grain they want to feed you to keep you alive, fair enough. But like, you're not, you're not going anywhere. 
Right. And that, and that was, you know, that was the story of, of low income people in most societies, you know, over, over basically the entirety of human existence up to the point uh, of the invention of markets. And so, so that's on the one side. And then on the consumption side, um, I talk about this also in the essay is one of the big things that technology does uh, in the free market context is it drives prices down. Um, and, and, and this is a big thing on, on inequality and especially income inequality that people, I think, miss, which is like one form of like determining the level of like income inequality or the, the value of one's income or whatever, right, is to look at it in terms of like, you know, what literally the, you know, as demarcated measured by units of currency, right? And so I either, I'm either making more money or less money. Look, the other side of it, right, of that is what is money used for? It's used to buy goods and services. And so if the price of goods and services is falling, that's the same effective thing to you from a standard of living standpoint as if you're getting a natural raise, yeah. right? Um, and so so what markets do and technology does is they drive prices down. And the more they're allowed to operate, the, the, the more they, they drive prices down. The, the traditional way that economists talk about this is they make the observation, which is as follows, which is the Queen of England always wore silk stockings. Right. Like the super rich throughout all of society, you know, throughout all of time have always had access to the best of goods and services, you know, great, you know, the, the best of available food and the best of available health care. Right. And so forth and so on, you know, of, of their time and place. You know, it was traditionally like you know, that, that stuff was all just, you know, silk stocking stockings and everything else. Right. We're just completely out of reach uh, of most people. And it, and it is precisely the engine of free markets and technology that bring down prices uh, so that regular people can afford these things uh, uh, as well. Yeah. And I, I actually, the, you know, maybe the most profound example of that is kind of the Internet plus the smartphone, because, you, you know, when you and I grew up, um, information uh, was kind of an elite thing to get to. And, you know, a big reason to go to university was the knowledge was all there. It was in books and libraries and all these kinds of things. And you couldn't, get, you, you know, you didn't actually have access to that otherwise. Um, and, and computers, by the way, also, we, we didn't have computers, you know, for, for individuals. And, um, and now, you know, the, at least, you know, the, the, the kind of poorest people in America, the homeless in San Francisco have better access to information and knowledge than the president of the United States did in, you know, 1980, uh, which is unbelievable. Um, so yeah. uh, to your point. Okay. Let me give you oh. give you one other one on that. And this this I find this totally mind blowing. So, you know, when we you Ben, you remember when we first started working on the internet in the nineties, you know, there was just this sort of endless kind of hand wringing at the time about this concept of the digital divide. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um yeah. and right, this this concept of basically, you know, digital technology, the internet, computers, uh, PCs and the smartphones were gonna draw we're gonna basically widen inequality because they were it was basically well off people that were gonna have them and then poor people wouldn't. Right. Um and then there was, you know, this is you know, this is maybe the, the effective <laughs> pessimism of its time is people were very very, very worried about that. You know, look, sitting here today in 2023, the following is true. Uh, more people in the world have computers in the form of smartphones specifically and internet access um, than have electricity or running water in their homes. Yeah, amazing. Right. Um, and right. So the, the, the digital technologies people were worried about are actually the most egalitarian, right, of all technologies that have ever been, ever been produced, even more than running water and electricity. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we, so, I mean, we, sh we should still be worried about like literally the gap in access to fresh water, like more than we should be accessed, uh, worried about the, the gap in access to like the, you know, the internet. And again, there, there, the there's water exactly divide. one, <laughs> the water divide, right? The electricity divide is like still a thing, but the, the, the digital technology divide actually turns out to not, not be a thing. And of course, and again, the reason for that, the reason for that is very straightforward. The reason for that is, 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 is falling prices. The reason for that is, you know, as the global smartphone market went to 5 billion people, you know, the, pr the price of a smartphone collapsed to, I don't even know today, uh, and, you know, in, in sort of the developing world, you know, it's, I don't know, 10 bucks or something. Um, and then, and then same thing, you know, internet access has plummeted uh, in price uh, over time uh, because of Moore's law and competition and, and, and innovation. Um, and so, so again, like if, so if you, if you, if you, sorry, the, the paradox, the, 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 the flip side of this is if, if you wanted a plan to be able to drive, you know, a something, a, a, any form of good or service that is important to lots of people um, to have it be available to everybody, you know, the thing to do is to lean harder into, into markets and into technology, right? Not, not further away. Yeah. Great, great point. Okay. Uh, next question from Max Churitich. Churitich. Um, <laughs> somebody's going to get me with one of these. It's going to be like one of these uh, kind of Simpsons jokes, but uh, technology makes life easier and necessary for a better future. However, how would you address humans getting overly dependent on tech to a point where we can't function without it? Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is, I would say there's kind of the full dystopian version of this, um, you know, which is sort of the Wally scenario, yeah. right? Um, you know, the movie in the movie Wally, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, ma- mankind in the future basically, you know, is all just like, you know, obese and, you know, literally sitting in these big like suspension, zero gravity suspension chairs and, you know, basically, you know, binging, b- binging Netflix and slurping, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, some of that going now. <laughs> Yeah, this might sound a little a little familiar, but in 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 our times, but but yeah, look, there 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 is this sense of like, okay, we we kind of you know at some point like you know we we live in sort of this automated you know I don't know farm environment or something, and we're kind of farm animals, and we're we're being kept fat and happy, but um you know we've kind of lost agency, we've lost free will, we've lost choice, we've lost you know any sort of you know sense of self reliance, self sufficiency, any sense of adventure, um and you know look I, I you know like I think there you know there's 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 certainly some you know some some argument uh you know kind of in that direction, you do see examples of that um you know what i what i try to do what i try to do in the essay and what, what i believe on this is a little it's a little bit a little bit subtle um which is look you know there are really big questions uh about the meaning of life um that you know people have today and have had for a very long time right and a lot of the history of human civilization has been you know debates around you know religion and you know which gods to worship and moral principles and how to order a society and what you know the role of the collective versus the role of the individual is and you know all these policy questions that flow from this and like you know the story of of human civilization is in some way the story of trying to kind of figure out all those questions and of course these questions are still you know at least for a lot of people still unanswered or are still open questions or are being open, you know, open, open to new all the time. Um, and, 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 and I think it's putting, frankly, too much of a burden. Like I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm an enthusiastic a proponent of technology and markets, but it's, it's putting a little bit too much of a burden on technology and markets to expect technology and markets to answer all those questions yeah. for all people. And so I, I, I think if you're looking to technology and markets to answer those questions, I think you're probably looking in the wrong direction. You know, I, I think you probably need to look inside, you know, quite honestly, inside the human soul, um, yeah. you know, where all, where all the hard questions lie. Um, and then the, the the observation I make is um, rising technological capabilities and rising standard of living right through markets um, open up the room right individually and collectively in our society to be able to ask those questions right so and, and the most obvious example of that is like when people are hungry they don't ask any of these questions the only question is like you know where's where's my meal coming from. Right. And you can kind of elaborate that all the way up and you can kind of say, look, like if the ultimate human problem is that we're all, you know, we're all full, you know, we have full bellies, our children are taking, you know, our our, our children are are, going to live great lives. You know, we're able to support our family. We're able to, you know, do all the things that technology is able to give us. Um, and we still have these big unanswered questions about the meaning of life, then basically what technology will have done is to open up the aperture to be able to actually spend more time trying to figure out those big questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that. That seems like a a very champagne problem for sure. It's funny. It reminds me of you know when I was in uh, elementary school. My brother was in junior high school. I went to the school play, and the play calculators had just come out. And the whole play was about you know this uh, society where nobody knew how to do math, and then the calculators all broke. <laughs> and so you know those kinds of fears, I think go with technology, but they tend not to play out in uh, very real ways. At least all the calculators haven't broken yet. Uh, that, that could, yeah. You know. Well, look, te- technology gives you the way. I mean, here's the other kind of serious observation to make is technology increases resilience to natural disaster. Yeah. Uh, so, so technology increase, like, so for example, you know, this, this comes up actually a lot in the climate debate, um, which is basically, you know, one, one of the, and I'm not, this is not quite a question of climate change making a different point, but you know, one of the, one of the questions over time is basically, is nature getting more, more or less dangerous? Right over time, right as 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 both the, as the world changes, as humanity changes, and so forth, and and basically, um, uh, deaths from natural disasters have been in systemic decline for you know a century plus at this point. No. right. Like it, it, you know, it used to be that if you were confronted by you know, uh, uh, you know basically any kind of <laughs> what's that cold, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, cold. yes, there's no heat. <laughs> Yes, yeah. people. Yeah, you, if it was cold, you freeze to death. You know, if it was hot, you know, with no air conditioning, you might, you know, you might die from heat stroke. Um, you know, any kind of tornado, flood, mudslide. I mean, look, you know, there was, there was, there was literally. What was it? There was, what was in Boston, like 150 years ago or something. There was like a molasses, um, uh, uh, basically a mass tragedy. Yeah. Um, right, where people like literally drowned in, in, a, in a molasses flood, like, <laughs> like nature i mean of all you know nature is vicious right like yeah. nature really has it out for you um and if you're unprotected in a state of nature like it you know the, the old the old thing is you know life in a state of nature is is is, is uh what is it a nasty brutish yeah, and short poor, poor solitary nasty brutish and short uh, 
hops. Yeah, exactly. And so, so look, te- technology, you know, it's, it's the, end of the flip side of the question is technology is now buffering us against, you know, sources of mass death um, that used to be, you know, far, far, far more common. Um, and so th- this is not to, you know, this is not to obviously uh, to sort of try to get away from the kind of the doomsday question of, of like what happens if it literally all stops working. But like, y- you know, how, how do we build defenses against the really bad scenarios in which that would happen? It actually turns out technology is our friend on that. Yeah. 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 And our, our, our friend Elon is, um, you know, protecting us against everything by uh, making us an interplanetary species, which <laughs> also deals with the yep. asteroid problem. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, look, the the, di- the dinosaurs had no plan B, right? Like, <laughs> nope. <laughs> Turns out. <laughs> so John asks, how can economic systems evolve to prevent human corruption from infiltrating advanced technologies that surpass our capacity for understanding? Yeah, Ben, what uh, Ben, what do you think? Or, or maybe you might, maybe you might narrow in the question a little bit. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I totally understand what he's getting at here, but I think that um, I I think human corruption, uh, you you know, there there is this agency problem. And I think that you you kind of alluded to it on the kind of nuclear fission issue um, where, you know, as uh, as these systems evolve, how do you keep the human interest from fouling them? Uh, and this kind of gets to, you know, heart of a lot of the things that you spoke about in the manifesto, which is, you know, for example, um, you know, we had this this banking crisis and everybody's intention uh, was to basically, you know, lessen our reliance on giant banks that became as powerful as, you know, many governments in the world. Uh, and of course, um, because of this uh Baptists and bootlegger issue where the banks were the bootleggers and the government was the Baptists, um, you know, they, 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 we basically got the opposite. We got much bigger banks, much more powerful. And that trend is kind of continuing forward. Uh, so I think that, you know, when we look at how systems get corrupt and, and, you know, and create real crisis, you know, we, we really have to be aware of the agency problem. And we're going through um, a few of those now, I think, both on AI and also on crypto, where actually a lot of the answer to, um, you know, some of these like huge, powerful monopolies, you know, like what do you do about tech companies getting so big and becoming monopolies? What do you do about banks getting so big and coming becoming monopolies? We actually have a magic technology that decentralizes power actually creates a real form of stakeholder capitalism where all of the participants in the economy get rewarded for building the economy. Um, And the biggest uh, adversaries of that whole movement end up being the kind of Baptists in the government, you know, conned by the uh, bootleggers and the big banks and so forth you know, kind of over highlighting small, you know, real but small dangers of the technology and trying to stop the technology in its tracks and kind of lead to this horrible agency problem where you have these very, very corrupt systems. Um, so I, I guess my big thing would be, you know, like be really careful when somebody goes, oh, this is a problem with a new technology. So therefore, we have to stop the new technology like that, I think, is is the pattern that's repeated over and over again and hurt us so badly on energy. And it threatens to hurt us on intelligence and threatens to hurt us on decentralization. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. One of the ways to think about this for people who haven't run into this in their lives is there, there's a fundamental difference between uh, pro-business and pro-market. Yeah. Um, and they sound like they're the same thing and they're not. Um, and so because pro-business kind of begs the question of which businesses and then sort of, okay, what's the structure of the market? And are we talking about mm-hmm. like, yeah, right, exactly. Are we talking about lots of companies having to compete and earn their way in the world? Or are we talking about ultimately crony capitalism? And basically, ba- and basically this is the pattern of basically what happens. This is kind of the point of the, the Baptist and bootleggers idea of what happens, which is basically a new, te- a new technology, something changes uh, in the world. You have big incumbent companies that very much are opposed to that change or want to control it. 
um, and, and, and want, want to control and want to lock it down. Yeah. Um, and so what they do is they go to the government and they basically say, oh, um, you need, you need to regulate this. And they, they don't go in and say, you need to regulate this for our benefit because they would get laughed at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what they say, so what they say is you need to regulate this. That'd be a dead you know, giveaway. <laughs> yeah, that would be a dead giveaway. So instead they say, we, you know, we, you need to regulate, really regulate this to protect basically the, you know, the little people. Um, right. Um, and, and, but what they're shooting for a hundred percent of the time, what they're shooting for is basically ba- uh, government, uh, sanctioned barriers to competition for themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and I would even argue like we, we don't even today in America, like we don't here, here I'll, I'll do a little effective pessimism. Um, you know, we don't in America today in most industries actually live in what you call a free market system. We, we live in more of a captured kind of big business cartel. Uh, ecosystem, and you and you look just across sort of sector after sector after sector, and what you see are sort of two or three or four companies that have you know overwhelming market share uh, in each sector and generate you know an overwhelming percentage of the profits and have this extremely incestuous relationship with the government. By the way, often to the point where they're actually writing their own regulations, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it's their lobbyists actually writing the regulations. Um, you know, it's the industry groups that they run. Well, the, the okay, classic I example is the majority of regulations works works exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. And of course, and then there's this, this other form of corruption, right? Which is the revolving door, which is like, okay, if you're, if you're a regulator, it is, you know, extremely tempting just out of pure self-interest, you know, to kind of do what these big companies want because they'll hire you, right? Um, after, after you're, after you're done doing that. And so this is sort of this corruption after the fact that happens with the revolving doors. Um, and so anyway, so, so, so this basically that, that, that you could be pro, you could be pro business and be completely in favor of all of that, right? Cause it is still businesses, you know, doing everything at the end of the day. Pro market, right? Says no. That none of that. What I just described is acceptable. That's not how things should work at all. The last thing any government should be doing is giving any particular company some special right or privilege, uh, yeah. some ability to block out new competition. And in fact, what you want is m- more competition. You want more competition, more markets, more capitalism. Uh, as actually the answer to that, precisely to keep the big companies from basically just taking over and not having to compete anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Hundred um, percent. And actually, that leads very well into the next question, which is. How exactly will markets prevent monopolies? Please elaborate yes. on your point. And I, and, I, and I think this is so key because, look, the nature of companies, even monopolies, is that the older and larger they get, the less adaptive they become. And we, we look, we've seen this with Google, who invented you know, most of the new AI technology and then was a little bit asleep at the wheel uh, you know, when uh, OpenAI release GPT, um, they missed it just because like they're big, they're complicated, they're slow, they're not as good anymore. And so if the new AI companies are free to compete, if open source AI is free to compete, then all of a sudden, that's the best kind of way to break that monopoly. Um, You know, similarly, you know, there's a lot of, you know, chatter on like, social networking monopolies and banking monopolies and these kinds of things. And, you know, again, we already actually have a technology that's a great insurgent technology to defeat those monopolies. And the thing that prevents that is, as you say, uh, not a pro-market, but a pro-business, a pro-very specific business, businesses that have enough money to bribe, corrupt, lobby the government into creating regulations that prevent the new company from competing. That's right. And we're, we're seeing a lot of that right now. I find the heart <laughs> to be terribly corrupt. With that in mind, can you ad- <laughs> elaborate on your statement, love doesn't scale? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if you meant because the heart is corrupt, but perhaps you do. Well, so I, I didn't say the heart is corrupt. So that, that was, that, that's fortunately, that's the questioner. Um, I mean, look, I, I think what that questioner is alluding to there, I would assume is sort of this, you know, perennial debate about human nature, which is, is man, you know, primarily good or, or bad, um, which, which we could talk about. But I, I, I think on the, on the thing about love not scaling, let me, let me hit that one directly and then we can maybe go to the, go to the bigger topic. So, so, so basically, you know, so this, so, so the, the formulation here is from a, a guy named David Friedman, who's an economist and Milton Friedman's son. Um, and the thing that he said that really stuck with me is, look, there's only three ways to get people to do things for other people, right? Fundamentally, um, you know, one is love and, you know, you see that and, you know, you, 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 you see that in, you know, people's families, you know, and they're in their friend, you know, friends, friend networks, like, you know, Ben, like I'll do things for Ben without him having to pay me. Right. Um, um, and so, you know, that, that, that is an important force. Or without me threatening to kick your ass. (laughs) 
<laughs> Coming to the other one, yes, exactly. So uh, without without four, so so there's love. Um, uh, you know, with without love, there's basically two other choices, and they're basically money and force. Money, right? Money's the carrot. Uh, uh, force is the stick. You know, look, money is capitalism's answer. You know, force was communism's answer. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is the and again going back to you know just beat up beat up on the communists a little bit more. Like this this was this was the big realization of all the communist societies in the in the 20th century and today, which is like. Basically, what 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 communism and its derivatives, socialism and so forth, expect they expect love to scale, yeah. Um, and so they expect that you should work in whatever you know the Siberian salt mines or whatever it is, um, you know, in order the far you know the, the fields or whatever, um, and you should do that out of love for your fellow man, and you should do that for you know love of the society and so forth. And and, and by the way, look, like you know the Nazis, the Nazis had their own, you know, the Nazis are the national socialists, like they had their own spin on this. You're supposed to do things on behalf of you know the German people is the same thing. Like you're supposed to love this macro unit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, the the problem is because the love doesn't scale. The problem is people just don't naturally love people they don't know, right? And 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 by the way, that's not like because I don't think I, my view. That's not because there's something morally wrong with them. It's because they don't know the other people, right? And the, and you know, it's like okay, are they are they being loved back, <laughs> right? And 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 like, are the other people going to be pulling their weight, right? Is is you know, is there going to be a free rider problem? And of course, you know, in the, the answer is at any level of scale, of course, there there are free rider problems if 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 if, if people aren't required to work. Um, and so a, a this is the irony of the heart of the whole thing: a society built on the idea that love scales becomes an incredibly dark, dystopian, hostile, you know, and ultimately murderous murderous place because because love doesn't scale. Um, you know, force, force is, you know, force is one way around that, which is okay. The way you get people to work, even though they don't want to, cause they don't love people in some remote area that they'd be working on behalf of is you put a gun to their head. Yep. Um, and then, and then, you know, the, the, the third option that falls straight out of that is okay. How about, how about money? And then, and then sort of money, of course, is a proxy money is a tool for, you know, sort of, you know, what they call sort of rational self-interest, right. Or enlightened self-interest, which is like, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get paid money to do this. It's going to benefit these other people. I'm not primarily doing it because it's going to benefit people I haven't met. Um, I, and I, you know, and maybe, look, maybe I love everybody and maybe I would love to meet all my customers. Um, and by the way, look, when you walk into a restaurant and, and you've never, you know, met the, you know, the, the, the owner or the host before, like they're thrilled to see you. Right. And so, you know, do they literally love you or are you their new best friend? No. Are they excited to see you? Yeah. Well, they have a very positive sentiment towards you because they know you're, they know you're going to pay. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, so that's the, that, that, that is the solution. You know, that's the best solution that we've come up with, Yeah, you know, barring some profound change in human nature, um, uh, in which people all of a sudden become far more generous than they've been historically. It, that, that seems like it's likely to be a stable state. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It reminds me of a interesting conversation I had years ago with a friend of mine who grew up in the Soviet union and, uh, you know, I, I made some offhand comment that, you know, like whatever, Stalin was a crazy psycho or, or that kind of thing. And he goes, what are you talking about? Stalin was very rational, very smart. Go back, read what he wrote, look at his speeches. He was super systematic thinker, very intelligent. And I was like, well, like what went wrong? Why did he kill 20 million of his own people? And he just said, when you take away the carrot, all you have is stick. And right. And that is so true. And I think a lot, <laughs> you know, that's a lot of the point at scale and your family. Yes, you can run a communist family. You can even run a communist kibbutz that, you know, at that scale, it, it can work for sure. Yeah, that's right. And, and Hayek, Hayek made this point and Deirdre McCluskey has made this point also, which is like, look, we, we do live in a superposition of the two systems, right? Because like, you don't want to be, you don't want to be the asshole who like, you know, have, runs your family. Like it's a capitalist enterprise. Like, you know, you charge your kids for, you, yeah. know, for, you know, rent, like, you know, for sleeping in their, in their, yeah. in their bunks when they're eight. Like, so like, you know, we all, we all grow up and, and in our family and friend environments, like we, we're, we're all communistic in, in that context. Right. But then there's this kind of, you know, schizophrenia to it, which is like, okay, we got into the world and the world doesn't act like that. And all of a sudden there's a different, a different uh, way, you know, way to, ex- way to exchange and a different way to relate. Um, and so I, I think, you know, ultimately, you know, the answer lies in sort of the superposition of, 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 of the small and the large. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, let's just say, yeah, the people who are too abstract on this, I think, get derailed. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's the exact point that everyone gets confused on, because who won't want the country to run like their family? That would be so much better. It's a, the problem is it's impossible. Yeah. Next question. Um, this, this is actually one that I think a lot of people have from Morton. How do you see private capital versus public research budgets when it comes to fundamental progress? Aside from AT&T's monopoly that drove Bell Labs, I've yet to see systemic uh, technological pro- progress from private investment. I think I would disagree with the last part, but I'll let you start. 
Yeah, so I'd actually say there's actually three models. I would say there's private, uh, there's public, and then there's a third that I'll that I'll come to. Um, so so look, like a couple things I think are true. So 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 one is again, I'll, I'll give the give the effective pessimists their due on this one. Um, also, which is look, like yeah, look, they're, 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 they're straight capital R research, you know, that that is sort of the time honored way of like discovering, you know, the principles of the universe and so forth, like. You know, look, the, you know, the, the the best of that has no idea if or when it will ever commercialize, right? Because by definition, it has no idea whether or not the experiments will even pan out, right? Mm-hmm. Or the theories are even correct. And so, you know, there is there is this kind of research that historically, you know, has been publicly funded. Um, you know, and, and look, in the U.S., we have had these agencies like the National Science Foundation that have done a lot of that for a very long time and have, you know, very good, you know, you look at NSF, you know, whatever issues NF, 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 NS, NSF has, if you look at like the totality of spend in their existence and then the results, you know, you would say, yeah, that was, that was absolutely an outstanding investment from yeah. a societal standpoint. Right. 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 Very long um, time and, and investments. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and yeah, the, and again, to, 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 to be an effective pessimist, that was, uh, you know, look, a lot of that research may not have been research that would get done by, by private companies. You know, look, on the other hand, I think private companies carry their weight more than people think. Um, and, and look, part of it is the, the questioner alluded to Bell Labs, but look, the, there, there is this, there is this thing that happens when these companies, you know, that when the best of the big companies get big and powerful, um, you know, they do more of this. They, 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 they open these labs. Right. Um, and so AT&T did it, um, you know, uh, I, you know, IBM and Hewlett Packard and, and Google and Microsoft and many, many, many others across many industries have done this. And I think, you know, quite honestly, part of that is, 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 is PR yeah. for them. They like to show that off. Um, I think part of that is, um, uh, you know, look, they, they start to think in terms of longer time horizons and they do want ultimately, you know, new products at some point. Yeah. Uh, part of that is it's a recruiting and retention exercise to get the best and brightest technical minds to stay there is to tell them that they can do research and publish their research. And so, you know, there is that. Um, and look, you know, Ben, you mentioned like, look, the, the, the breakthrough on AI just came out of Google, right? It came out of a private company, yep. um, you know, which is a, which is a, a, a great example of that. So, so yeah, look, there's some it, tension it, it there. You know, look, quite a few researchers out of academia to pull that off. <laughs> they did. And in fact, that's been a long running source of tension actually between the tech companies and the universities for the last 15 years or so, which is as these new tech companies have built these big research labs, they have pulled a lot of the good faculty out of the universities. Um, and, and by the way, that process, I think, is accelerating in AI specifically because because the, the capital needs to, to actually do modern AI are so big that actually universities can't afford to do it right now. Um, and so actually, they're, yeah, so you get this kind of issue of like, are you are you sort of uh, are you draining the, the universities of their remaining competent professors? Um, and, 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 le- and leaving only, only the other kind. Um, so, so yeah, so look, you, and you could debate, and we could have a long debate about the pros and cons of public versus private. Um, there is a third model, and this is the one that people often talk about, um, you know, as sort of an aspiration, which is this idea of these very large societal projects. And in, 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 in the U.S., you know, we talk in particular about the Apollo Project and the Manhattan Project, right? And we say, like, you know, this is kind of a frequent lament from kind of declinists, right? Which is, you know, why can't we have more Apollo projects and Manhattan projects? Um, and, but, but I think that's actually a third model, and the third model is, is military. Um, and, 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 and militaristic, right. Um, and both Apollo and Manhattan basically were, you know, like Manhattan was just a straight up military project, right. To build a bomb run by the military. Um, Apollo was, you know, was, was a sort of a civilian thing, NASA, but it was in the context of a, of a military arms race with the Soviet union, um, and a technological arms race with the Soviet union in a, in a, in a much more militarized society than we have today. Um, and so, and, and of course, when the military gets involved, two things happen. One is they can do things at speed when they really want to because they just tell people what to do um and then also you know they they get access to a lot of money you know when when, when things get when things get rough yeah. um and and so I, I personally i go back and forth a little bit on this is like do we want more manhattans and apollos on the one hand it's hard to say no on the other hand do i want a society that is that much more militarized <laughs> you know if that's what's required I don't know. Yeah, that could be like what, what what would what would that mean for what is happening in the world if we get back to the point where we're as milita- militarized as we were in 1941, right? Or even or, or even 1960. Yeah. No, it's actually one of the great things about the modern world is we have so many fewer wars and at a smaller scale. Um and every war is still horrible. Right. Okay. Yeah, and look and hopefully hopefully that continues, right? Yes. Okay, here's a, here's a uh a, a good simple question. From Tux, how do you bridge the gap between being anti-statist and supporting America first policies or maybe yeah. American dynamism as we do? Yeah. So I look, I think that um, all these things are, you know, end up being a question of 
power and how it works. So in an extreme, the, the, the extreme form of, uh, form of statism is communism, where 100% of the power is in the public sector um, and no power is in the private sector. And, you know, that has the issues that we spoke of. I think that, um, you know, no <laughs> public sector uh, can quickly go to anarchy. And, you know, that's not at least not something that I would advocate for. So I think, look, as a society, you know, we kind of have this collective, you know, there's a certain amount of collectivism in shared values, shared morals, um, you know, what's okay, what's not okay. In America, we have things like, you know, freedom of speech, freedom to be who you are, um, you know, uh, kind of, and, and we're very anchored on the, the, these kind of free society ideals. And you need, <laughs> you need a state to do that. Um, I, you know, at least I believe, I think that there are probably some people that don't believe that, but you need a state for that and preserving that, th those, those values, um, and that way of life is extremely important. And that is, uh, you know, largely the role of, you know, that that's primarily the role of the government with all of us citizens participating. And, you know, we try to participate in that through, you know, our, Amer our American dynamism efforts. And that's important. So um, when, when uh, you know, when I say I'm anti-status, I'm really saying I'm anti-communist and anti too much weight on the public sector at the expense of free markets and basically freedom uh, for the citizens. Yeah. Yeah, Ben. I think you you might you may I, th I think I think you might or you you probably mean broaden out um, you know anti communist also um, or by extension anti authoritarian. Yeah, for sure anti. I think I think those go together because it's hard to be an authoritarian unless you have an amazing amount of the power, right? Like it, right. even if you wanted to be authoritative authoritarian in the U.S. and we we certainly look at authoritarian tendencies from time to time from various politicians and leaders. Um, but it's really hard to do because you don't have enough power to pull it off. Uh, and that's the greatest thing about our system, I think, is you can't gather enough power uh, to become completely authoritarian in the U.S. And, and that's, you know, maybe the most fundamental thing we want to preserve. Zach T., can you further define the law of accelerating returns and how it may play out in the future? Yeah, so I think it's... Um so I think it's, uh, <laughs> I never know whether to use this as a, it's such a great metaphor. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and use it. So it's a, Paul Romer uses this metaphor. He says, ideas have sex. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's say ideas reproduce. They, 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 uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, they, they go through the same, uh, uh reproduction and evolutionary process. <laughs> okay. uh, as living organisms. That's different than having sex, by the way. Uh, yeah, you're right. Okay. That's bad. Now that we have birth control and all these things. <laughs> 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 longer, long, longer, longer, longer form of is, is probably better. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically what happens is basically basically the, the argument is basically ideas beget ideas mm -hmm. um, uh, in quite the same way that people beget people. Um, uh, so basically it's like the more ideas that you have, um, the, the, the more combinations of ideas you can have. Uh, and those combinations of ideas are themselves ideas, um, right? And then based on that, you know, then they, they can further, you know, kind of replicate, you know, they can kind of crossbreed uh, and have uh, and have offsprings. And and so, and, and, and you, you see this anytime, of course, you're building any kind of technological product is, you know, you're pulling in ideas from like all over the place. You know, you're getting inspired by, you know, all the different technologies that are below you in the stack. You're getting inspired by all the other applications anybody has ever tried to build. Um, you know, you're getting inspired by all kinds of things. You know, look, a, a, look, AI is inspired by, you know, the neural structure of the brain. Right. Like, you know, quite literally, right. Driving, you know, from from biology cross, cross sort of cross right over into computer science and mathematics. Um, and so basically, uh, basically, they're, they're, you know, at, at, at its bat, if this process is working the way that it should, you should see an, you should see sort of this accelerating explosion of variety and sort of speciation and reproduction and, you know, and, and, and scaling of the number of ideas in the world, um, you know, that, that sort of feeds, sort of catalytic feeds on itself like a chain like a chain reaction. Um, by the way, this was also the argument to connect this back to the idea of human population. So this, this was the uh, argument for this guy, Julian Simon, who I admire a lot, oh, yeah. um, who, who uh, wrote this book called the ultimate resource. And, you know, he, he was all, he, he, and he, he did a lot of his, a lot of his work was in the sixties and seventies when there were all these pitch battles, of course, around natural resources, environmentalism. 
Um, and he was kind of the avowed enemy of the Scott Paul Ehrlich, who was the guy who he was the guy who predicted, you know, mass famine and death, um, you know, from kind of increases in, in technology. Um, and, and so Julian Simon said, no, actually, what you want is you actually want a lot more people in the world, right? Human, humans, people are the, the ultimate resource, right? Not any kind of raw material, but literally people. And he said, why do you want more people in the world? Because if you have more people, you'll get more ideas. Yeah. Right. Um, and so more people means you'll have more ideas, more ideas in combination with ideas leads to more ideas. Those ideas lead to ways to make things better in the world. Uh, among the things that those ideas make possible are ways to support more people on the planet. Right. Um, and, and, and so he said like that quite literally the answer to natural resource consumption, right. For example, or natural, you know, natural resource, whatever limitations, uh, or environmental considerations or whatever, the answer is not the Paul Ehrlich approach of depopulate, right. Reduce the human population, therefore reduce the number of ideas, uh, you know, both the number of people, and the number of ideas. The answer is to actually put the pedal forward, more people, more ideas, more solutions. Um, and you know, yes, clearly that's, uh, that, uh, I, I agree with uh, him, uh, in that argument. Yeah, no. Amazing. But by the way, Julian Simon is probably uh, one of the most underrated economists and philosophers of the last hundred years. So if you're not familiar with him, he's a that's a great one to read. Um, but a great thing, I'll just on that real quick, a great point that he made that really blows people's minds when they read it for the first time is he made the argument that you never you never run out of any natural resource. Yeah. Um, and he had this, a bet on know, that, like, right? Like, uh, he did. He did. So he had a famous, he had a 10 year bet with Paul Ehrlich, the population bomb guy. Um, and it was a bet on the price of a basket of commo a basket of natural resource commodities 10 years in the future. Right. And Ehrlich was, of course, 100% well, that's convinced. When, that's that we the first peak oil, you know, da 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 da. Yeah. The whole peak oil thing, exactly, is that same thing. And so he, and he let Ehrlich actually define, I believe, the, the basket of the, of the commodities. So he kind of loaded it in his direction. And, and, and the bet was, will the price of this basket be greater or less than it is today in 10 years? And, you know, everybody who's kind of in the sort of conventional thinking on this, you know, was like, well, obviously, the prices of all this stuff are going to go up for, you know, are going to go up because there's more people, there's more consumption. And that's what everybody wrote you know. in the, the, the press for many, many years, like, like nobody was saying what Julian Simon was saying. Right. And then the, the kicker is Julian Simon won the bet. Uh, the price of that basket was lower in 10 years. And, 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 and his point, the point was we never run on natural resources. His point was with markets. Um, the way that we know that a natural resource is becoming scarce is it price is its price starts to rise. As its price starts to rise, self interest says we should figure out ways to not need as much of that natural resource. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, right. And so, as the price of oil rises, then all of a sudden we have an economic incentive to develop alternative alternative energy, ranging by the way from solar to wind through to things like nuclear, yeah. and then you know maybe in the in the future even nuclear fusion. Um, and so, it, it, so it's actually it's it's markets working at their best. It's as, as the price of something rises, the your incentive, your your self interested incentive to come up with the alternative uh, uh, rises, um, and, and 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 alternatives that were not previously price effective. Uh, actually become price effective, right? Um, so this was, you know, the, this is the rise of fracking, right? Fr fracking worked because oil and gas started to get expensive enough where all of a sudden the additional cost of fracking was actually worthwhile, yeah. right? Um, and so, and then fracking brought the price rate back down. Um, and, and, and fracking was a classic example of, a, of an idea. It was a technological innovation made, born by human creativity. Um, uh, and so ba basically what Julian Simon says is that that is how the system, that's the homeostasis kind of in the system um, and this is not a dystopian scenario in which we are doomed to run out of everything and everybody's going to freeze and die. In fact, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily utopian, like it's still like natural resources still cost money. Yeah. Um, but it's a fundamentally positive view, which is it is human ingenuity that is going to cause us to not have the problems that the doomsayers say we're going to have, which, which, and again, you know, 300 years of this and, you know, so far so good. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an abundance view of the world as opposed to a scarcity view of the world. It turns out the abundance view is right, which is good news for all of us. Yep. Um, so Matthew has a question, which uh, I think you have an unusual answer to, which is, is the dream of fusion stopping us from enjoying the insane gains we can get from fission? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, um, so, uh, well, primarily, so <laughs> primarily what's preventing us from enjoying the insane gains from fission. And by the way, they are insane. Like the, the level of energy that we could be producing from uh, modern nuclear fission reactors and the, 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 and the, the, the safety of it is like just absolutely right, France like we could, doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. France is doing it. For, yeah. By the way, France just got, I mean, the European politics are so entertaining on this because France is so pro-nuclear and the rest of Europe is so anti-nuclear. France just had to get a waiver from Germany um, to continue to run their nuclear reactors, <laughs> um, which, they, which they finally just got. But the, the thing a, going in France is their fission reactor. 
Yeah, and the the German Greens, you know, have been determined for fifty years to turn those reactors off. So, um, so um, uh, yeah. So look, like the, the the big reason why we don't have widespread nuclear fission power today is because of the precautionary principle, because of the basically the fear of of, of disaster, um, and you know, which basically makes people emotional, and then and then it turns out here the emotional decision is a, is a very is a very very damaging bad decision, because the alternatives turn out to be things like gas and coal. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's overwhelmingly it. Um, now having said that back, back to the question is, yeah. So the, the new thing that you can say, if you're trying to fight nuclear fission is, oh, we don't need it because we have fusion right around the corner. Um, and by the way, look, I, I, I start by saying, I hope that's right. I hope fusion really is right around the corner. Um, you know, it's been right around the corner for a while. Um, I hope it's right around the corner. That would be <laughs> yeah, great. It turned out um, to be harder than fission by quite a bit. Yeah. It's, it's quite difficult. And then look, I think what's going to happen is I look, I think we'll get fusion to work at some point. There's very smart people working on it. Um, uh, I think they'll get it there. Um, uh, I think the same forces and ideas and people that have prevented the deployment of nuclear fission will immediately prevent the deployment of fusion. Um, and so I, I think this idea that all of a sudden the, the same kind of bad narrative, uh, corrupt pessimism, It'll be the same arguments. It's this incredibly dangerous thing. And who knows if it goes wrong? And like, what if it this and that and the other? And like, you know, um, you know, we can't take these risks. And can they prove it's going to be, you know, safe forever, infinitely? And it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same arguments. Um, and they're going to, you know, these these nuclear fusion companies are going to start out being very optimistic. And they're going to hit this wall of sort of regulatory and emotional and political, you know, and ideological resistance. And, you know, I could, I hope they punch through it. But, you know, look, yeah, I was I would say this like Richard, Richard Richard Nixon did two things in the early in the early seventies uh, around around this. One is he declared something called Project Independence, where he said we were we the U.S. would build a thousand new nuclear fission power plants by nineteen eighty, become completely energy sufficient, be able to withdraw completely from the Middle East, be able to you know be zero emission, um, and then he created the nu- Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which then prevented that from happening. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, they they they. How many new uh, nuclear reactors have they approved? Zero new plants in 40 years. Um, So. (laughs) Not good. Well, and again, and and again, here you you, you go back to, uh, you know, sort of incentives. Um, Okay. Now imagine, okay. Now, you know, again, give the devil his due. Like imagine that you're the newly appointed, you know, regulator. You're the newly appointed chairman, you know, Ben Horowitz, you're the newly appointed chairman of the nuclear regulatory commission in 1973. Right. Like what are your incentives? Right. Like how much glory are you going to get? Right. If that somebody if we built some new reactors versus how horrible is your life going to be if there's another nuclear accident? Yeah. Right. 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 Another kind of incentive agency problem. Yeah. Right. And then, by the way, you've got the existing energy companies in there doing their thing. Right. Saying, oh, no, you know, don't worry about it. Oil and gas. And by the way, we're going to do, you know, we're 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 going to clean where we're going to have clean oil. (laughs) We're clean oil. We're going to have clean, you know, the V, you know, Volkswagen, we're going to have, we're going to have clean diesel, right? Like, you know, we're, we're you know, just let us, you know, continue working on the clean coal and the clean diesel. And then, and then, you know, again, by the way, fusion's right around the corner and that'll be better. And then, you know, you're like, wow, like, you know, these companies, like they're so big and powerful and successful. And by the way, they seem like they're kind of hinting there to give me a job when I'm done here. <laughs> yep. And you're, you know, you're back, you're back to square one. This is a fun one. Luke Croft, you say that humans want to be productive, yet so many hate their jobs and work only because they have to. When it comes to abundance due to tech innovation, should we allow people the option of not working? <laughs> so, so there's these two V and look like the, again, no, no utopianism here, right? Like, you know, look, not all jobs are fun. Like, and look, a lot of people work jobs that, you know, they really don't like and they're doing it because they have to, and you know, they're doing it because they're trying to support a family or support themselves. And so, you know, I, I mean, certainly that's, you know, no, nobody, nobody promised everybody a job everybody loves. Um, so, so look, I, you know, again, I think, you know, there, there's sort of a point to that. Um, I, I guess what I, what I would say, my analysis is there, there's, if you close your eyes and imagine somebody who doesn't have to work, right? Um, and, you know, like, and I'm not talking about like, you know, stay at home mothers, you know, I, I'm talking about like somebody who like, you know, in our system today would be working to be able to make money, support themselves. And then there's a future ordering of society in which they can elect not to work and they will have the, you know, same or similar level of material, material comfort that they have today and they can just kick it. Um, you kind of close your eyes on that and imagine that person. And there's kind of two, you know, possible versions of that person you can imagine. One is the person who is now, you know, 
by the way, as Mark said, you know, liberated um, to, you know, what was Mark, Mark's this whole thing? We're, we're all going to be fishermen in the morning, you know, literary critics in the afternoon, poets, you know, over dinner and, you know, musicians yeah. at night, right? Like we're, we're going to be able to like, you know, self-actualize into, you know, all of these things that don't involve money. And we're going to be, you know, we're going to all be creating this and that. And we're going to be, you know, doing all these amazing things um, because we have all this time free. Um, and, and look, th- there are some people for whom that's the case. Right. Like that, that, you know, there's, there's certain people for whom I'm sure that would be the case that look, there's the other scenario. And I would just call that one, the Cheetos and meth scenario. Right. Yeah. Which is like, <laughs> yep. And PlayStation <laughs> and PlayStation. Right. And like, and I like Netflix. I'm a fan of Netflix, but like maybe not 12 hours a day. Yeah. Um, right. And like sit on the couch and get baked um, and get, you know, and just like, there goes all your motivation, right. Straight out the window. Um, and, and this is where I, 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 you know, I, I brought, I use in the, in the term, the, in the, in the essay, the fairly provocative term, like farm animal, like that's a farm animal existence, yeah. right? That's a, that's the existence of a cow, yeah. right? And like cows are great, <laughs> cows are great. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't think we should be cows. Like, I don't think we should be farm animals. I, I don't think that is an advance. Uh, you're, you know, you're back to the, the Wally scenario we were, we were talking about at that point. And I just, I, I think we just need to be real, realistic about that. Uh, and again, this is one of these, this is, this is very much one of these luxury belief things, yeah. um, where kind of the class of people who imagine themselves as being the, you know, poets in the morning, fishermen in the afternoon, musicians at night, you know, think that that's a general, and maybe that's true for them, by the way, maybe if, you know, you went to one of these, you know, Ivy League universities and you hit your job as a barista and, yeah. you know, you'd be much happier and you'd, you'd be writing poetry if, if you didn't have to do your day job, um, you know, maybe that's true for them, right? But like the consequences of that misjudgment, if that's wrong on, you know, the other 8 billion people, I think are very profound and possibly extremely negative. Yeah. And, and actually, we, you know, we've run this experiment in the U.S. Uh, to some extent. And I, you know, I've been studying this more lately, but, you know, perhaps, you know, there were a lot of uh, kind of bad things that happened with the uh kind of pilgrims and the Native Americans. But I think the worst thing may have been the reservation system, at least the longest lasting. And the reservation system is essentially UBI. It's $65,000 a year, I believe, per resident. And, you know, anybody who spent time on a reservation knows like that, that that just hasn't worked out well. Like removing purpose from people's lives, uh, you know, generally, you know, there are people who can deal with it, but but that's I think certainly the minority. Um, and it's, you know, I, I mean, at least in my view, that's not been great for the Native Americans and, uh, and to, to kind of scale that to society as many are proposing these days. Um, it's probably not the best thing. The other thing I'll add is jobs have actually gotten much better over time. So not all jobs are great, but like, look, they, you know, for, for many, many, uh, hundreds and, you know, thousands of years, every job was farming. And look, not every human is suited to be a farmer. Uh, <laughs> I know you weren't, Mark, because well, there's a lot of farming in your hometown. Um, and then, you, you know, the the thing that came after that first was these assembly line jobs, which, you know, it's always kind of amusing to see politicians say, oh, we need more good jobs like these manufacturing jobs. Like doing this all day <laughs> like a robot is not like the greatest job in the world. You know, it may pay well, but it's not the most fulfilling. And, you know, so many of the the people on those lines are on drugs. And uh, in fact, Henry Ford, you know, famously doubled the minimum wage. But the reason he doubled the minimum wage was he had so much attrition because people hated those manufacturing jobs so much. And so I think that, you know, the jobs that we're producing now have been increasingly interesting. And, you know, they're not all great. Um, they're not all great for everybody. But one thing is for sure is we have a much broader variety of things that people can do. So you have many, many choices. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully people can find the job that's right for them. How, oh, this is interesting. Coinfluence X. <laughs> so that, that's a pretty neat name. How do you perceive the contrast between rigorous technological and mathematical education seen in countries like China, which emphasizes relentless advancement with evolving educational paradigms in the West, which prioritizes intersectional perspectives and social values. Yeah, Ben, why don't you uh, start? That, I agree. That's a that's an interesting one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, it's tricky. You know, like, and then you know, it's been a long time since I've been in school, and 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 my 
children are all adults. Uh, so I'm a little far away from, you know, the actual thing that's happening in schools now. Um, having said that, boy, I think that um, there's kind of education that you can use <laughs> uh, that's, you know, where you can go make something or build something or figure out how large systems work or, um, you know, perform like a in-demand function in society. And then there are, you know, a whole class of other things. Like you can teach people about anything. Uh, you know, now they even have, you know, lots of like rap education in college and this and that and the other. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because the great musicians I know, and I know many of them, never took any kind of class like that. Um, most of them didn't take any class in music, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny, like uh, my friend Kanye uh, taught himself music. You know, he was an art student. He taught himself music. Uh, and I think that, you know, for creative, you know, the great creatives, you know, I, I, I don't know if studying, you know, to become a, a virtuoso in those things is, is necessarily the, even the best path. And then you have these other things, which are these social theories, um, unproven social theories that, you know, a lot of people are teaching these days, which I, I think those are fine hobbies. Um, and, you know, you and I pursue them as hobbies, <laughs> uh, studying these social theories and, and, you know, how to, you know, maybe, you know, new ideas on how to organize society or whatever, or how that all works. I, I don't think, you know, it, it makes sense to, charge people $300,000 or whatever college costs these days to teach them a hobby that like, that seems really absurd to me. Um, but, uh, you know, like I, I know people have different views on this, but I think that, uh, you know, the, the purpose of, you know, the education that we funnel young people into ought to be, uh, to enable them to make significant contributions back to society. And that, Probably, I don't know if it's as narrow as the Chinese education, but um, it's probably not as broad as, as some of the things that we're doing. Yeah, and then I might just pop the question up one one level, which is, you know, look, education itself is an industry. It's a, you know, it's a field and an industry, a business. Um, and, um, you know, look, both the nature of the American education system and for that matter, a system like in China's, um, you know, they're they're primarily centralized and government controlled. Um, right. And so, you know, the American system is, is, you know, K through 12 is primarily a government monopoly with, you know, occasional, uh, offshoots. Um, and the offshoots are very restricted. Yeah. They're very, very, and very small, uh, in number. Um, and then, you know, look, the college system in the U S is a cartel. Um, and you know, it's quite literally a self-regulated cartel, um, uh, by virtue of the fact that it, it requires, it's on the sort of federal student loan drug, um, to work financially and, and, um, and then the accreditation agencies that determine which colleges get federal student lending are run by the colleges themselves. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's a self-reinforcing cartel, which is yeah. why you don't see a lot of new universities uh, ever. Um, you know, it's why the, the major universities in the U S are older than the country. Right. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, like in, in the same thing, you know, obviously in China, the systems, you know, government, government controlled inherently, you know, completely government controlled. And so and that's, you know, this is commonly true around the world. And so, you know, we've sort of backed into, you know, we have this idea of education as like an abstract kind of kind of good. And then we have this specific implementation of these highly, cent you know, highly centralized authoritarian non market based approaches to it. And then, you know, you can argue the pros and cons and the results. And the, I thought the question set up this you know, very interesting aspect of it, which is like, okay, you know, when does it become kind of too much rote memorization versus when does it become kind of too much, you know, kind of, let's say, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of wild, wild theorizing, yeah. um, you know, with maybe a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. Um, but, you know, look, the, the education as a system can't really respond and adapt to changing needs of people because it's primarily not market-based. Um, and so we kind of just get the system we get. We send our kids to it. We don't think we really have a choice for the most part. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I would just say, like, the, the big thing is it's just in, in all these societies, it's, it's just stuck. Um, and, and, and look, and then there are all these signs that it's becoming dysfunctional, uh, you know, across, across, across many societies. We could, we could spend hours on that. 
Um, and so I, I would just at least, you know, want to want to kind of put a placeholder and say, I think we should also squint and kind of wonder, like, is there a different kind of system that could get built um, that would be much more market driven uh, and much more technologically sophisticated, um, that would be much more better suited to modern needs and would be much more subject to, you know, actual competitive pressure and the need and the need to be good. Um, and, you know, we, you know, look, there, there are some very good education startups working on this and there are some very good charter schools and there are some very good new startup universities. And so there, you know, there are some people taking swings at this, but, um, you know, at a macro level, like we're not there yet. And I think maybe we should think over time about trying to get there. Yeah. And there's a, that, 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 that's interesting because we do, we are in the middle of this very interesting crisis, um, the student loan crisis where, yep. uh, you know, and president Biden has kind of proposed and, uh, I, I don't know how much of it has actually gone through all the legal objections and so forth to kind of forgive some portion of the student loans. But the interesting thing about that is that that's kind of the ultimate treating the symptom and not the cause, because why can't any of these students pay back their loans? And the obvious answer is college isn't worth the money you pay for it. And then it doesn't right. translate into a job that enables you to pay back but you borrowed to do it. Um, and, you know, if you think about, you know, that's a much bigger problem for young people and an ongoing problem that, you know, like yeah. you, you either kind of subsidize college in its entirety um, or, you know, you have to fix that problem. And I think that, uh, you know, given what colleges are willing to do with their tuition, like grow at double the rate of inflation, um, yep. and hire more administrators than they have students and all these kinds of things if they have free money, uh, you know, another incentive problem that, you, you know, that it's a pretty dangerous idea to make college free in that way. Um, so you, 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 we do need a, a better mechanism for sure. Yep. Maybe now's the time. Um, hopefully. Okay. Sam Arnold, to what extent do you believe we really control what technology does after its release? Can we exert any meaningful control after invention? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. So one is obviously we do we do control. I mean, there are <laughs> there are pretty strict controls in a lot of areas, right? Um, as 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 we just discussed in the nuclear case. So you know, one is it's, it's not quite that there there aren't any. Um, you know, I think the maybe the underlying question here would be: Can we predict what the consequences are going to be? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and by the way, this is a very hot topic right now because you have this thing where there are, you know, a bunch of AI, you know, kind of practitioners who are making these very, in my view, very extreme statements about what AI is going to do that's going to be horrible. Um, and there's this, you know, very strong temptation on the part of people to, to make what seems like a very logical, you know, kind of assumption, which is that the people who invented the technology are in a, you know, are in the best position to be able to predict what happens, um, with it afterwards. And then are, are, you know, presumably also going to be in the best position to propose the, whatever regulations or controls are required to prevent those, those things from happening. Yeah. Um, I have not in my life and I have not in my reading of history seen a lot of examples where the inventors of technology are very good at this. Yeah. Um, nope. You know, the, the example I like to cite is uh, Thomas Edison uh, invented the phonograph and he was completely convinced that the use case for the phonograph uh, was going to be to listen to religious sermons. He was a very pious man um, uh, and he took religion very seriously. Um, and he just assumed that if you owned a phonograph, the point of it would be you'd get home at the end of a long day at the office or in the factory. And you'd kick off your, you know, you kick off your shoes, put in your slippers and you'd have your dog by your side and your kids gathered around and you would put on religious sermons. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> and you would have to hours. go to church and bother with all those people which for Thomas Edison was a big thing. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, and by the way, so, right, and, right. And then, and then you could do this every night, right? You didn't have to wait till Sunday, right? This is great. You can do this all week. Right. And, and, you know, I don't know, like, look, a few people do that. Um, most people don't, most people listen to music. Um, and, and, you know, Ben, you'll recall, you know, uh, the, you know, the, what was the, the first form of music that went, you know, kind of was kind of the big hit, 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 uh, genre of music on phonographs was, jazz oh yes yeah, yeah yeah sure 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 and you'll re and you'll recall what people said about jazz at the time <laughs> well they said it, many things but it, it, it wasn't real music yeah, yeah. it was the day it was the devil's music it was very bad it yeah. was you know channeling of all kinds of unholy impulses it was going to cause young people to fornicate like they, they just had like all, all basically all the same things that people say about rap no, music today, I, I, I was or, thinking you know. of something that uh it wasn't quincy jones it was um i, I can't say it because but but they, 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 there was some racism involved too i'll just say 
Oh, of course, of course. It was absolutely. It was. It was going to be. Yeah. All of a sudden, you use a channel for these black musicians to show up in the in the homes of white people. Like, no, no, no question. All right. And so, so, so anyway, like it, it turned out that people had like all kinds of issues with the technology. It just turns out they weren't remotely the issues that Thomas Edison predicted that they would have. Right. And and and, and if you look at this historically, you're kind of like, well, of course he didn't know because like he's just a, like yeah, he invent, he's a he's a he's a techie. He just invented the technology. Like he's not, you know, he doesn't have like a crystal ball. He doesn't have some special foresight. And in fact, he's a particular kind of person. He's the kind of person who spends all of his time in a lab. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. He's, he, he's unusual. He's unusual. Right. And he must maybe speculate, you know, he might be psychologically a little bit different than most people. Right. And he, and he, and he, you know, has a, di- gets draw satisfaction from different things and he doesn't spend a lot of time right with like regular people. Yeah. Um, and you know, he's certainly not an expert on like politics and society and, you know, psychology and sociology and all these, all these, all these other, all these other things. And so I, I, I so, so anyway, I think where I would start back to the original question is just like, wow, like I actually don't think it's that easy to forecast these things. And then specifically, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think specifically it's any easier for the people who invent the technology to forecast these things. And I think they carry uh, a lot of unjustified credibility. This also, you know, came up in the Oppenheimer movie, you know, the same thing. It's like these physicists, you know, all of a sudden, right, are convinced that they're the ones who are going to be working on like the game theory and the philosophy and the morality of the deployment of nuclear bombs. <laughs> yeah, well, they were. <laughs> well, they tried, they tried, but you know, it's, that, that was the, the nature of was a lot of that. Yeah. It was, but I mean, it was, this was the scene with, uh, you know, Truman, which is something that actually happened, right? Which is like Oppenheimer shows up to, you know, kind of wring his hands about the morality of the atomic bomb. And Truman is just like, get it, get this guy out of here. <laughs> like that's, you know, I'm the elected president of the United States. Like, you know, let's listen to me. Yeah. Um, right. And by the way, he, you know, Truman, and again, I'm not that Truman made all the right decisions or whatever, but Truman was the duly elected president of the United States. Like he is the guy who should have been making that decision, not the guy who invented the thing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just think like, I, I guess my big appeal here is just like humility. Like, I think we as technologists need to be very careful. Um, <laughs> we're not, but we should be very careful about kind of crossing the line and deciding that we're going to do societal engineering kind of in our spare time. Um, and then, you know, people who hear technologists kind of doing these things should be very skeptical that the, te- that the technologists deserve any kind of unwarranted uh, credibility on this. Right. Um, and, and then look, there are going to be these big questions. Uh, what history basically says is we figure them out as we go. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think the alternative to that is to just not do new things. Um, and so I, you know, I know where I come out on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give a plug for a great book that you recommended when reason goes on holiday, which is sort of the story of how the great physicists and uh, inventors um, did on politics and policy and game theory. You take super high IQ people and you put them in a research or university setting. Um, they go crazy. Like on like, they very frequently go very nutty on anything involving politics and society. Yeah. Um, and you know, this was the American physics community in the 1920s and 1930s that basically like most of them went like hardcore communist, like Einstein, Einstein was a Stalinist. Yeah. (laughs) Like we don't, you know, we don't talk about these things anymore, but he was right. Um, you know, these people end up like very radicalized and, and, you know, this happens with other groups of people, right. You know, maybe, maybe this, you know, at certain points this happened in in other areas of, of, of our life, but, um, in our public life, but you know, it definitely intellectuals go straight for it. Um, Thomas Sowell's talked about this a lot. He's like, look, he's, you know, basically the problem with people who are hyperverbal and like working ideas is they can get kind of arbitrarily unhinged. Yeah. Um, and they can, you know, kind of talk themselves into crazier and crazier things. Um, and they're, they're, you know, and their level of disconnection from the, from, from the real world means that they, you know, they, they no longer have any governors and how crazy their beliefs can get. And so I, I think we need to be like, I think that's what's happening in AI right now. And I think we need to be very cautious uh, about who we listen to. Yeah, yeah. Trust in their own judgment is, is profound. <laughs> um, okay. Last question. Uh, this is actually one that uh, I would have asked. It's from bird and it is before publishing. What did you consider the most controversial point? Now that it is live, what makes people chimp the most? <laughs> <laughs> so what did I think was the most? I don't know, Ben, you read draft. Let me ask you that. You read the drafts. Yeah, uh, you read the drafts. What did you, what, what were you predicting was going to be the most controversial thing? Well, I, th- I, I thought for sure when you wrote it, you know, everything on the economic front about free markets and, um, you know, what to, <laughs> love is unscalable and those kinds of things. I thought those would uh, be the most controversial for sure. Those are kind of time honored crowd pleaser crowd pleasers when it comes to get, making people mad. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, they, they, <laughs> it's just like the nature of humans that they disagree on that. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, I would say, I don't know, like, and Ben, you tell me if you think I'm, I'm missing this. I, I think most of the attacks, <laughs> I think like a lot of artists, I aspire to have a better class of critic. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, like a lot of the, you know, this is one of these things in kind of the, the modern climate, like a lot of the attacks have been on me. Yeah. Um, more than on the ideas. Right, right, right. Um, and if I were, you know, including the one that you started out with um, earlier, um, like the smug interpretation of that, you know, on my part would be, you know, wow, the ideas must all be great if they're reduced to just attacking me. <laughs> yeah. The um, ad hominem attack. Yeah. Like if that's all they've got, like I, I must have otherwise made, in, you know, outstandingly excellent points um, and they must not have counter arguments. Um, uh, I would love to see, I'll just tell you, I would love to see substantive, I would love to see more, there have been a few, but I would love to see more substantive responses that, that, that have, that are legitimately like carefully thought through. I agree with that. I mean, I think a lot, you've gotten a lot of emotional reaction. I mean, I think some of the, the more thoughtful ones are just probably on um, a misinterpretation of what you said, which is, uh, you know, some people interpret it as technology gone wild, <laughs> you know, like the girls gone wild video of the, uh, whatever era that was. Um, it's like technology gone wild, just like let it roam free. And which wasn't what you're saying. It's just, uh, more like, are we going to keep doing new things or not? Or are we going to kind of nip them in the bud the way we did nuclear fission? Um, but like you, you always, you know, like you build something, you've got bugs, you've got issues, you have, you know, the internet's had, crime on it since like, uh, you know, the very, very early days. And we keep working on that, but the benefits of the internet outweigh the, the negatives and these kinds of things. And I think people, um, you know, wanted you to, uh, be more on one hand on and on the other hand, but it's a manifesto. So you don't do that in a manifesto. <laughs> exactly. I, I thought there was uh, one piece of feedback uh, on Twitter. I thought somebody made a really smart point. Um, one really smart point I saw was, um, you know, it was back to that love force money thing. Um, yeah. Somebody said, boy, like, isn't it the case that actually a lot of innovators actually like a lot of creators of, of new things actually are doing it out of a sense of love. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of, and that's a good point. It's like a lot, I mean, by the way, broaden this out beyond technology, but like a lot of, you know, artists, a lot of musicians, um, a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, writers, um, you know, this is, this, this, uh, the concept of the labor of love, right. Um, yeah. is like, they really feel like they're contributing something. Um, and you know, lo like love of society, love of their fellow man is, is, is in fact a motivation, even if they would also like to get paid. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a, that, that, I thought, you know, there's, there's, the accusation basically was I was pre presenting too kind of crimped a view of human nature when I, when I narrowed down love that much. Yeah, I think that's right. Although to, you know, if you invent somebody and then you need to, hire a bunch of people to work for you. That's where love runs out. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> They're not all going to join on that. And, you know, similarly with the musician, your, your, your publicist, your makeup artist, your this and that and the other, they, they, they seem to need money. Yes. All right. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, for this uh, episode of the Mark and Ben show. We hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next time.